You'll get your paychecks up to two days faster with early pay. True story. Welcome to Huntington. And with that typical false start, uh, we, <laughs> we are off to a, uh, a rousing um, start here at the week that was. Uh, Deadline Detroit's um, look back at the week's news. Today, I am hosting. I'm Nancy Derringer. Thanks for joining us. And um, Saeed Khan is, I believe, on the road, as is fearless leader Alan Lengel. Um, I'd like to welcome our panel this week. Uh, depending on when you're, where you're watching this, I guess I will start on my left, which would be uh, Detroit Free Press columnist uh, M. L. Elric, Alan Lengel, co-founder of Deadline Detroit, Adolph Mongo, political consultant and man about town, and Bryce Huffman from Bridge Detroit. I, you know, I just want to say before we get started here. Um, when we put this panel together on a weekly basis, it's always Alan and me and Saeed, but we strive for diversity in, um, in our panel. We, we like people of, of different colors, different face, whatever, whatever we can do here. Genders. Um, and well, exactly. Today, though, I am the, I am the sole uh, uterus owner on this uh, panel, <laughs> and so I just want to kick things off by saying that I am titanically angry at the Supreme Court decision today, even though I was expecting it and knew it was coming. Um, and I just want to say that I think it's incredibly ironic that this decision is the direct result of the election of a president who I would be willing to put my next three paychecks down on a bet that he has paid for or been responsible for more abortions than any other president in American history. And yes, I'm going there. So why don't we kick things off with that topic? Anyone want to uh, raise their hand and go first on this one? Yeah, oh, nice. I, I'll, I'll jump in on this one uh, as as my team is literally slacking each other, you know, messages about how we want to cover this. Uh, you know, I, I went to an all guy Catholic school. I remember being one of the uh, pro choice voices in a lot of those classes to just come out and say, like, this is not about protecting life. Uh, this is not about respect or sanctity for life. It's about control. Um, and like you said, we've a lot of us expected this to happen, um, but it's still the result that that frustrates me to no end. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a very measured statement, but I think it's I, completely reasonable. I, Alan? I, I, I think it's I mean, it's interesting. Look, the vote was six to three as as predicted. I mean, there was some question whether Roberts would, would go there, but he did, apparently. Uh, and, and, you know, the sad part is these hearings that we've had, are, you know, so farcical. These people lie about it. They all said, you know, Roe versus Wade, it's established law. Basically, why would I mess with it? Uh, and then here it is. Clearly, there was no, you know, I mean, clearly, Clarence Thomas and Alito were going to vote for it. Uh, but in, in, in the rest. And, really. and, and Amy. Yeah, um, Amy. Amy yeah. Right, right. And she was definitely, I mean, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's Taliban. I mean, we're seeing it more so in places like Texas, where it's a full on Taliban kind of thing where, where religion and, and, uh, you know, morals are, are, are being imposed on everyone else. But I, I think it's just disgraceful. It's really a sad day. I'm here in Washington, D.C., uh, I, I was telling Nancy I would have set up my computer in front of the Supreme Court, but it was a little <laughs> bit too noisy. But. Yeah, the demonstrations are um, are already. I mean, they were in front of the court. They were waiting for this, but um, I just got a uh, a message uh, about one that's planned for 5 p.m. today in front of the federal courthouse in downtown Detroit. So, if anybody is looking for a way to um, get it work off a little steam and and yell real loud that's uh that's a place you might want to consider going um you know i was raised a catholic and you know i'm older i'm one of the older people on this panel um although i think i'm probably right in the middle you know <laughs> you're, like... you're in the median yeah lango is the oldest oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> i thought you were adolf <laughs> But I just, you know, I was raised a Catholic, and I don't remember abortion ever being talked about in our church. Um, it was not discussed in the in homilies. It wasn't discussed 
uh, much outside of it. Now, of course, when I was a kid, abortion was still illegal. I mean, Roe v. Wade came when I was like a sophomore in high school, I believe. It, but it, it was it, never a thing. Go ahead, it Adolf. Was, it was talked about when I was coming up because I had an I had an aunt who had a best friend. This is, and she told me this in the nineteen fifties. Uh, her oh, about twenty twenty one. Uh, got pregnant. Her mother took her to the neighborhood underground abortion clinic, and she died of an infection after right. an abortion. And yeah. and that really had an effect on my my aunt because she always talked about that was her best friend, right? You know, and and she always wondered why didn't she just have the baby, but you know that was that was her choice. But to look back at this ruling and say it was Trump's fault, no. Every it, it, listen, the Bushes had a, a a play in this. George and his daddy. George uh, H. Bush, uh, uh, they they put Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, and Joe Biden and them beat the hell out of Anita Hill. They they embarrassed her. They made her seem like a little tramp before the the, the national uh, uh, spotlight, and and they voted to let this guy. Uh, become a Supreme Court justice, even though they knew he was bad news because he got up there and said, "Oh, you messing with me? You lynching me because I'm a black man? He's nobody. He's not a black man. This guy hates not only himself; he sure. hates his family. He hates everything. And now he's talking about uh going and revisit a whole lot of other stuff. This, it, it, so I lay the blame not just at Trump." I get Biden get a little bit of that, and the Bushes get a lot of that, and Obama. They, why didn't they persuade Ruth Ginsburg, who was so sick? Apparently, he, he tried. He tried, and it didn't. You know, she just she. You know, she has free will. She would, but you bring up a really good point. I don't know how many people. If you know, this is a work day, and a lot of people haven't had a chance to um, dive into the. Uh, uh, the ruling itself, but Clarence Thomas has a concurrence in this case where he says it's time to revisit Lawrence versus Texas, which is the one that said that basically gay people were, you know, able to have sex with each other in their own homes without fear of, uh, of law enforcement barging in. And Ober Obergefell, I can never remember how to pronounce that, um, which is the same sex marriage decision. He says it's time. Okay, we lost Lingle here. It's time. It's time to um, to revisit those decisions. And I mean, you know, talk about talk about rolling, turning the clock back. I mean, what about you, ML? What do you think about this? Well, I don't know why anybody's confused. The Supreme Court is working from a principle that they've established for the last couple of years. You have a right to life until we shoot you. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I think that's probably yeah, we want everybody. Who can possibly shoot you to have a gun? Yeah, yeah, so, and let's make sure. Yeah, to, to come. I don't know what this new Senate compromise on gun control is going to do because I have a feeling once it gets to the Supreme Court, that's going to get drummed out as well. But when we're assigning blame, and I don't know that that's the most productive use of our time here, Democrats after Roe versus Wade became the law of the land had a lock on Congress, the House mm -hmm. and the Senate. I'm somebody who believes that the Supreme Court shouldn't be passing laws. And I believe it's been worse in recent years than ever before, where Congress has no courage. They punt every time there's a tough question. They wait for the Supremes to make a ruling that we all have to abide by. And this is what happens when you don't do the job that we send you to do. You yeah. leave the work of 400, 535 people, up to nine people who may or may have not gotten there legitimately. And then you get what you get. And to me, the Democrats, when they control Congress, if they truly are the party of choice, they should have codified this with legislation that went through. Because if Congress had passed this, I don't think there's any way whatsoever that the Supreme Court could have overturned it. We gave these jokers with robes a lot of room, and they're running wild. 
Yep, you're right. You know, it's funny you should mention that. I I heard um, some interesting um, reporting in May when the leak came um, about kind of the history of abortion rights as they evolved in this country. And, you know, I told you when, when I was uh, in high school is when Roe passed. But before that, uh, New York had liberalized its abortion laws. And consequently, there was a flight. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. There was a flight that left Port Columbus Airport every morning at eight o'clock, and um, it was full of, of young women and teenagers sitting with their mothers, uh, looking very scared. And it came back, and they came home on the five p.m. from LaGuardia Airport. And you know that was, it. and if you had the resources, if you could afford the plane ticket, and if you could afford whatever the clinics in New York were charge charging, that's what you did. And of course, that's the way it's going to be in the future, because there are going to be some states where this is going to remain legal. But, you know, for poor women, um, you know, there's been some heroic reporting by like the Washington Post and some other papers about um, what it takes if you are, if you live in rural Wyoming, you know, what it takes to get a legal abortion in a place like that is just, it's unbelievable. I mean, the, you know, driving and then having to, to stay because there's a waiting period and blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's amazing. So, and you're absolutely right. The, um, the, uh, uh, what were you talking about? Oh, the, the Congress, you know, doesn't do its work. There was a, a pretty good story in the Indianapolis Star this uh, week about Marvella Bai, um, who was the wife of Senator Birch Bai, who was a, a, you know, a moderate Democratic senator from uh, Indiana. And she was really, it was about how she was really the driving force behind Title IX, which was um, one of Evan, or not Evan, that's his son, Birch Bayh's signature achievements. But I was really struck as I was reading that about like what a, what Congress w could, w once was and could be if people had the courage for it. They actually got stuff done. I mean, you know, they had, uh, they had their, uh, you know, they passed Title IX. Birch Bayh worked on two constitutional amendments. Can you imagine Title IX passing today or, or any constitutional amendment, much less two of them? I mean, he, he was uh, involved with the 25th and the 26th. The 25th was the, uh, you know, the one covering removal of a president of a, you know, against his will. And the 26th was 18 year olds uh, giving, getting the right to vote. So, well, the, the interesting right. thing is that Dana Nessel has issued a statement this morning saying that she will not prosecute anybody who performs uh, any, any trained doctor who performs a, uh, an abortion. So that's, yeah, that's heartening. Yeah, I guess. Um, she's, yeah. I mean, you know, Gretchen Whitmer and, and Dana and Nessel have vowed to kind of stand in the breach on this one. And, and, you know, I'll take them at their word. Does anybody want to offer any thoughts on how this might affect the governor's race? Given that we have, uh, that all of them, all of the Republican candidates that are still standing have right. um, expressed a, uh, um, you know, have, have, just have proclaimed themselves pro-life. Anyone? It's Elric. You know, I, I think it all comes down to women and um, and what's what's going to happen now is something that I can't predict because I'm not a woman. But um, but is this an issue that women care more about than guns, taxes, lockdowns, vaccines? I mean, are women going to vote on a single issue like this? Yeah. Is Tudor Dixon going to be the nominee? Um, I think that's a big thing. If it's going to be I, I think the biggest thing that's going to be a threat to Whitmer is whether Tudor Dixon is a nominee or somebody else. Because if it's a guy and they say something about her, you're picking on me. But if Tudor starts throwing haymakers, that's a girl fight. And everybody likes to watch those. Nobody's going to cry foul. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think Whitmer going to have to really come in uh, to the city and, 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 and unite these black women who, when they come out to vote, they they have a pretty powerful voice. That's one of the reasons why Stabenow got elected, because of the last minute push uh, by black women in the city of Detroit to get the vote out. And and and, and I think that you know uh, that with the history of the Michigan Democratic Party, they haven't done a good job when it came to. Uh, campaigning inside the city, just ask Hillary Clinton campaign. 
they just uh, blew blew off the city of Detroit, and there it was. Ask James Blanchard. He blew off the city of Detroit, and 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 he gave us England. So you know, it, it's going to come down to the strategy of of, of those women that advises. Uh, the governor, uh, uh, whether you want to uh, go into the stronghold where women really elect women. We have a lot of uh, women judges inside uh, Detroit, Wayne County, even even going into Macomb and Oakland County. Oakland County really has uh, seen a large uh, influx of uh, people of color, especially women. Adolph? So, they got to come here. What do you think she's got to uh, promise them? To get them out? <laughs> well, I, listen, I, I don't even know if she has an agenda. <laughs> her, her claim to fame is to fix the damn roads. Right. And, you know, and it, it, basically she's been she's been invisible to, uh, to this community. She raises a lot of money. Uh you know, she's playing the, the politics when it comes to appointing people in judicial positions. Uh, so she's doing just enough for folks to say, OK, you know, I can vote for her again or I'll vote for. Her, but I, I haven't seen an excitement of, you know, you, uh, you know, we need to get out and, and, and get this woman reelected. You don't I think, think we've Gilchrist seen is a uh, is an asset then? I didn't hear you. I, do you. You don't think Garland Gilchrist is an ex is a is an asset for her? I, 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 I you know what? Nice guy. Yeah. He's a, 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 a nice guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't see this really having a huge impact on the governor's race because uh, the people who support Whitmer right now are going to vote for her again. The people who are kind of on the fence about her, maybe kind of for the same reasons Adolf said, for not really being super visible in Detroit. I mean, who are they going to vote for? Right, There's no right. one on the Republican side who <laughs> speaks to the issues that they care about or uh, speaks to any of the issues that they're currently facing. So uh, for Whitmer, they really, won't vote. This really needs yeah. decent voter turnout, uh, and she's got it. Well, but they, but they yeah, don't I vote. Mean, if they don't know, vote, it's just like voting Republican. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's and, the, and how many the people in that Blanchard race voted for the World Workers Party? I think the exact number of people who voted for the World Workers Party hmm. are the number of votes Blanchard needed to beat Engler, and so there was another choice. But I think Adolf's right. People might not vote yeah. uh, the, because you know, really, for those of us in Detroit, after the primary, the election's over. Right. Everybody who gets nominated by the Democratic Party is rolling in November. So there's a few of us who live in districts like the east side where there's more outside of Detroit than inside of Detroit. So maybe we have a stake to come out in the general election. But the key is, how does that Republican candidate go after Detroiters? Do they leave them alone? Do they take them for granted? Or they Trump did a huge black suppression effort and he got 5000 more votes in Detroit in 2020. Than he did in 2016. Mm -hmm. So if you have a candidate who's well funded, who's strategic, and plays that, you know, how could you do any worse game? You know that that sure. could hurt her. And and <laughs> one of the people I want to know how they're going to be is, is Kim Trent. Kim Trent is a major player in black women's circles in Detroit. She's an advisor to the governor, and I think if she has a strategy, the governor probably better listen to that. That, there's no question, and, and people forget Mike Cox uh, beat Gary Peters for attorney general by 3,000 votes because Jeff Figer says, I don't want a Gary Peters, so he put a guy named Jerry Kaufman in the race as in the Green Party. Jerry Kaufman got 50,000 votes. Huh. He got 50,000 votes, and Mike Cox became the attorney general by 3,000, 4,000 votes. So, you know, when you don't want someone and, and, and you say, well, they're not going to support the Republicans, 
But if they don't vote or they go vote for some obscure uh, person in, a, in, in the green or independent or whatever, it can it, it change uh, 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 the scenario uh, real, real, real quickly. But you're yeah. right, uh, Elric. The governor need to listen to Kim Trent. Kim Trent been around a long time. She covered it, uh, the city as a, uh, a Detroit news reporter. She had worked for Stabenow. She had worked. She had been. She's been here. So Whitmer, if if if, if they are concerned about the election and, and and what effect does this ruling has can it bring out more votes i think they need to look at that and say well you know what we need to go in there and get those women that's gonna have to deal with it that's poor women of color whether they brown or black that yeah. don't have, that can't get a ticket to uh, uh a train ticket to uh, Chicago because Illinois is is on the safe side of the tracks because the train ticket is not a hundred dollars. It's just as much as a a, a plane uh, ticket. So you're gonna have people going to back alley uh, so-called abortionists, just like folks go and get this. Uh, liposuctions get these shots in their butts and you hear about them dying because of uh you know these people are not qualified cut, cut to rate make plastic TV. surgery yeah yes <laughs> yeah you're right you know um ml you brought up uh the november election um or trump's election in 2016 which seems a pretty good segue to talk about the other big news on the national stage this week which were the january 6 hearings um is anyone else besides me and Alan watching it? Yeah. Yeah, you are? Okay, it's how about you? It's confirming a lot of stuff that me and others have been thinking for a long time, that there was a concerted effort to hijack an election. Um, a conspiracy. And, right, and, and yeah. the thing that I've noticed is there's no way for me to look at these hearings as anything else. Um, a... a planned effort to take an election and i don't understand how people are missing that when they when it, well i guess people who are watching the hearings i don't understand how they're missing that but then i also have to acknowledge there's a lot of people who are not watching these hearings who are kind of tuned out mm. of this news our news cycle uh changes so quickly that i think some people uh if it doesn't catch their attention span right away you know, I, I got to say, um, I have to say that I think it's a it's the way they're being um, presented is much better than I expected. I mean, whoever I, you know, Nolan Finley was bitching that they hired some Hollywood producer to help him with it. But whoever like organized the framework for this thing is, um, phenomenal. is right on. It's Excuse phenomenal. I, I yeah. say it's phenomenal, the yeah, presentation. I, I, I was on the plane yesterday watching it. Fortunately, there was a little TV screen in front of me on the seat, and I watched it. I was just so, I found it so compelling. I thought, this is like, I remember watching the Watergate hearings, and I right. was so glued to the TV whenever I could watch them, and I thought they were so compelling. And I think these are equally as compelling. The only differences, the two differences between these hearings in the Watergate hearings is one in the Watergate hearings, the presidency was in the balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other difference is these crimes that they're talking about are so much bigger than Watergate. <laughs> they're so the magnitude of them is like, you know, Watergate, we're talking about a break in and maybe some money laundering and some, you know, lying. But they were just very narrow. It was a very narrow slice of America. This is really su such at a grand magnitude. It's so much bigger than Watergate. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you know, to to have these um, these hearings set up like chapters almost, um, you know, the uh, the first I mean, Tuesday, it was um, the election workers and, you know, the state level election workers that um, that Trump and his his, you know, evil minions tried to manipulate. And then yesterday, the Justice Department. I mean, the description of that meeting and in the Oval Office when Trump wanted to appoint 
you know, this total toady, Jeffrey Clark, to the attorney general in the waning days of the administration and all of those, you know, other AGs and, and U.S. attorneys essentially saying, if you do this, there are going to be this mass, mass um, uh, resignations and the, the department could almost collapse as a result of this. And it, it's something about reading that sentence in a news story, like uh, Trump backed off from his plan when threatened or when, when others threatened to resign. And then you hear the description of what that meeting in the Oval was like. And it's because Clark was in the room, I guess. And they're essentially saying, you're an environmental lawyer. You've never right. tried a criminal case. You've you're never... a moron. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> essentially, it's like, we'll call you when we have an oil spill. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it was outstanding. Right. So I just, uh, I mean... Anybody else? It was hard. I'll just say real quickly, it was very heartening to see how these guys stood up to Trump yeah. and they stood up to that, that goofball Jeffrey, Jeffrey Clark. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it, I found that really uh, heartening. Yeah. Well, I think one reason why these hearings have been so compelling, and in terms of hiring a TV producer, Donald Trump hired Bill Shine from, from Fox News. So let's, exactly. let's forget about who's hiring TV producers, okay? Yeah. This is how it's done. But I think one reason why they've been so compelling and also why probably so many people aren't watching them is because Kevin McCarthy basically kept Jim Jordan off of his committee by taking mm -hmm. the uh, quote unquote loyal Republicans who are now all looking for pardons out of the equation. You pretty much just have some straightforward questioning as opposed to some guy jumping up every once in a while saying, well, you know what, what, what about the price of gas? And what about ha what happened in, uh, with, with, uh, with the embassy where everybody yeah. got killed, where we had three yeah. investigations, people, people lied, people died. You know, we don't have those clowns there. And I think it's probably unfortunate because the Fox news folks would put them on TV, but Kevin McCarthy has basically said, turn this into a, a grand jury situation where you only have prosecutors asking questions and the witnesses you know they're they're just kind of stepping up it's yeah exactly it's, it's terrifying but it's like bryce said it's, it's not surprising we just know you know exactly how bad it was but anybody who didn't think this was screwed before they gaveled the first hearing in just hasn't been paying attention yeah right. this guy who who keeps commenting via our youtube channel says something yeah, use like your real name you chicken shit. yeah exactly <laughs> He says it's not a court. It's all hearsay. It's like, no, it's not a court. Yeah. And it's what's a, your name? A congressional what's your name again, dude? Yeah, Markham. Chicken shit Jones? Okay. <laughs> but anyway, there is a strong, because we played a, the state of Michigan played a role in all of this. There is a strong Michigan angle to these hearings too. And, you know, the, uh, yesterday it was the fake electors. Um, you know, we, we learned that at least one and perhaps two of the people of the 16, uh, people who presented themselves as the real electors and tried to, um, take over the, the, uh, cat or not, they didn't try to take over. They tried to get into the Capitol on December 20th, this Capitol in Lansing. Um, that's kind of interesting too. You know, I'd like to see some of those people, uh, brought up on charges themselves. Let this, let these the 72 year old realtor somewhere, whoever she is, or the 85 year old guy. I mean, let's see how they handle the subpoena. I I'm envisioning a, I, and it's not going to be before the election, but I'm envisioning like a 120 page indictment, multiple defendants, uh, Jeffrey Clark, Rudy Giuliani, uh, president, ex president Trump. I, I think, I think we're going to see, a massive, massive. I, I think we the fact that they raided Jeffrey Clark's house yesterday out in uh, Virginia. I, I think we're we're getting the message that the Justice Department is is on track and in in you know in sync with what this committee is doing. Right. Exactly. You know, I I I'm for the my fifth election. The the primary will be my fifth election. I volunteered to be a um, poll a, a uh, election worker in the city of Detroit. I signed up during the uh, pandemic and I did 2020, 2021, and this will be the 2022. And, you know, it's funny, there was a lot of, uh, there was the, the testimony of, um, was it Miss Ruby, uh, the woman in Georgia and her daughter who basically have had their lives just 
you know, ruined by their experience of being a precinct poll worker in the city of, or in the, in Atlanta, it really resonated with me because those women, those kinds of women are what are the reason that Detroit has, you know, the elections that it does. I mean, they, they staff the precincts, they count the votes at the absentee boards. And, you know, it's not, it's not exciting work. It doesn't pay very well. I mean, I think that, and the pay keeps going down now that COVID is easing, but they show up to do it. And, you know, that her, to hear, uh, I think her name was Shay, say that, you know, Rudy Giuliani, that piece of shit, is calling her, like, is comparing her to a crack dealer because she passed something to her mother, which he claimed was a thumb drive so that they could, you know, do, steal the election from his boss. And, you know, she says it was a mint. So there you go. But yeah, you, 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 you're going to carry your Glock with you because the Republicans are organizing a militia to come down to Detroit to challenge uh, uh, the voting and the county. You know, these folks are crazy. So yeah. I, I hope you're prepared to uh, <laughs> defend yourself. I don't have a Glock, so I can't bring one. But, you know, I'm trusting the security guards will keep those guys, those you know, the people out of the uh out of the huntington center at least with a uh with a you know when when that's going on but um anyway anyone else want to say anything yeah. about michigan's role go ahead bryce you know i was i was at the tcf center uh on election day and the day after the election when the stop the count protests were happening right and the the visual of watching these mostly middle-aged and elderly black women trying to just diligently count the votes you know hundreds of thousands of votes while mostly white people who are not from the city of Detroit, uh, a lot of them not even from Metro Detroit, um, watching over them, you know. And pounding them on the windows. Pounding was, on the windows. Yeah, yeah it's an image that'll, that'll never leave my head. You know, I'm, I'm only 27, um, but that image is going to be with me for decades. And yep. it, it's, there's a lot of thoughts I have on it, but just the stark difference of, intention in the people who were there mm -hmm. um it's very telling about where we're at not just as an american society but um in the state of michigan and the, and then for trump to talk continually about how corrupt detroit is as though he was going to win the city of detroit i mean give me a break ml you had your hand up well so i was at the tcf center too and i was on both sides of the glass at different times and my concern is with this Supreme Court ruling that says you can basically carry a gun anywhere you damn well please. If we're going to have people with guns on the other side of the glass, all it takes is one of those fools to say, I'm going to shoot through the glass. And I'll tell you, Detroit police are not equipped to handle that. Uh, the folks who are doing the counting, they didn't sign up to get shot at. And, you know, when you have people who are irrational, who are well armed, and who feel like they are the new patriots, they are the new Minutemen mm -hmm. trying to save the society, uh, they may derangedly, but in their own mind rightfully, think that using arms to secure the vote is appropriate. And as a reporter, I sure as hell don't want to be there when these fools come pouring through that glass, uh, guns a-blazing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how any volunteer would want to be there. I mean, my grandma was a poll worker, too. Yeah. Now, you find that somebody wants to sweat my grandma when she's 85 years old, just trying to do her duty, maybe have a little bit of a social. Use your real name, chump. But uh, <laughs> have some sort of social thing, um, you know, because I think for a lot of poll workers, this is a chance to see friends and, uh, and to get out. Right. Well, that's, why, that's, that's why I want to see a lot of retired black police officers, deputies, Detroit police, because a lot of these assholes who say they're going to come here to Detroit, they're, they're cowards anyway. They, they're cowards. They only know how to shoot people in the back. They only know how to go into churches and kill people. They only know how to go into schools and, and kill their fellow students. So let us, I, 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 if they want to organize a militia to come down here, Somebody need to organize a, a, a 
some uh, counter militia of the fence. <laughs> yeah, a counter militia. You know, I don't want to be caught in any crossfire, but I'll just tell you this: you know they're cowards because they're carrying guns. Because if you step to me, I'll slap you. <laughs> I, I have I have something to say just real face, quickly. I may just say we'll get you later. Yeah. <laughs> I was, was going to mention about the TCF Center when they, they finally decided to cover up the windows and people were screaming, oh, my God, they're doing secretive things and they don't want us to see it. The, the, the counters were right there. They were being intimidated by these crazy people banging on the window, screaming at them, and they wanted to make it a little bit more pleasant for them to finish their task. They're all so holding they up their the phones. Windows. Yeah, they're yeah. all holding up their phones too, you know. And, right. and it's, it's, it's like just... nowadays you're going to end up on, you know, the Gateway Pundit or something, you know, with a uh with some some scary music over it and, you know, this is this is just a bunch of I don't know. It's 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 so appalling. And Ryan Kelly, I might add, who is currently according to current polls leading the field in the for the Republican gubernatorial nomination is the one who told um, a voter, you know, meet the candidates audience that if they saw something they didn't like um, when they were voting in August and November to just go over to the tabulator and yank the cord out of the wall. It's like, and this guy wants to be governor of the state of Michigan. There you go. It seems like the, the, the biggest, bigger nut you are, these days, the better chance you have of getting the nomination in, in the yeah. Republican Party. Well, you know? and that's but kind of, you know. If it's any comfort to you, I was leading in the polls for quite a while, and I got the shit kicked out of me. So I went <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sure that Ryan Kelly, with all his experience on the Allendale Planning Committee subcommittee for the study of subcommittees, has all the experience that we need to get this state going in the right direction. You have you ever been to Allendale? <laughs> I have. Oh, I have too. It didn't take long to get through it. Well, the only th be the best thing ain't got to Allendale was an empty school bus. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's um, let's bring this uh, a little back a little closer to home. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Dan Gilbert's. Um, return to the bargaining table with the city of, of Detroit, uh, asking for an additional $60 million in tax uh, breaks for his Hudson's site project, which is yet unnamed. Um, I think there's been some, some very smart things said about it and some fairly dumb things said about it. I did like Chad Livengood's piece in the news last week where he talked about how these are simply always part of the calculus when a new project goes up in the city of Detroit because the commercial uh, real estate tax, property taxes on these projects are simply astronomical. They're way out of proportion to um, comparable states. But anyone, floor's open, ML. So, so I read Chad's piece too. And I had two immediate thoughts. First of all, who's his source on this? The guy who wants a tax break. Why didn't he talk to any tax officials? Why didn't he talk to the, the, the Michigan Municipal League? Why didn't he talk to some people who have some expertise in this? The guy who said the taxes are too damn high is the guy who wants a break on his taxes. So I'm going to need somebody a little more uh, removed from the process to convince me that that's the truth. Fair enough. But second of all, Chad, who's a very good reporter, he talks to Fred Durhall about his position on this. Fred has taken more money from Gilbert's PAC than anybody on council, and Chad doesn't ask Fred, reporting 101, did those donations have any impact? He's, uh, he's selling his vote. He's selling his vote and support. He's well, selling his vote yeah. and support when he I takes the money. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'll just tell you that's this. That's true. When, when you write a story and you don't ask a basic question that every reporter should ask, and then you let the guy who wants the break tell you that, that the game is rigged. That does not feel like like thorough journalism to me. The other thing is we had our city council president saying, well, you know, we're going to put this on hold because we need to get some more information. We need to get some more facts. We need to understand the deal better. We need to make sure that everything we thought we got in writing, we got in writing. When I heard that, I said two weeks ago before the free press put this on blast, you were ready to vote for it. Now you're saying you need more time. <laughs> Sounds like they're getting a little. A little that's, that's not a long time. 
and there's two things you always heard at the city council table all the time. The devil's in the details, and we need to do our due diligence. Now, they may still be saying that I'm not there now, but they sure as hell ain't doing it. So right. That's why the city council president's own admission that they're not ready to vote on something now that they were prepared to vote on two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Where well, they right. fell in the heat. They feel in the heat. They feel in the heat because they, 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 they was going to just quietly give him an ATM card, as I call it, where he can go and just get his money. Uh, they, they've they been taking his money and 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 they, and they want his money in the future. It's a it's a pay for play. There is, there's no doubt that they they are influenced by. The donations that that, that they've been getting from Dan Gilbert, he can give him a grand, and he getting sixty million. He can give him huh. five grand, he getting sixty million. Unbelievable! Not, a good Bryce, investment. Bryce, sometimes you have to throw an elbow to get a word in edgewise here. So um, <laughs> yeah, so, get a word in edgewise. You know, it's it's not unique to the tax abatement issue that City Council will be almost ready to vote on something. Uh, a media outlet will do a thorough report on it and why maybe voting on it's not the best idea, then out of nowhere, they're like, oh, we have to fight misinformation. We have to uh, socialize the public to this idea and, you know, really get Detroiters behind it before we vote on it. Mm -hmm. That's something that we saw uh, with the shot spotter contract that they were going to approve. Um, they took it off the agenda to inform the public about something that we had already known a lot about. Uh, and this tax abatement issue is the same way. They're they're either you know want to quietly pass it through, or they want to pass it through after they get enough vocal support for it. Mm -hmm. Now, for me personally, when I look at the issue of the tax abatement, Gilbert's got a lot of money. Why would you start a project that you couldn't afford to finish if it if it really is that dire to the project? Right. That's that's my simple question. I okay. understand that it's expensive commercial real estate is not cheap but he knows that he knew that before he started well, and part of what he knew before he started was that eventually he could get some public money to help him make this happen and and really the point is when have we ever seen a project where there hasn't been an overrun i mean right. it's it should right. be assumed that there is going to be an increase in costs it happens it, it, all the time and it's interesting that this issue comes up the same week that i think it was the Free Press uh, published a piece on how the Renaissance Center is em slowly emptying out. Um, this, you know, the work from home uh, revolution has come and gone. Uh, offices are trying to, or employers are trying to restock their offices with people, but people are essentially voting with their, you know, with their resume. They're saying, I don't want to do it, or three days a week is too much or whatever. I mean, they've just gotten used to it. So here he is wanting money to build another skyscraper that could potentially stand as empty as its neighbor down the street. So that's, well, you know, a lot of this is going to be a hotel. And a lot of it's going to be residential. Yeah, so I, I understand. Mean, but there's so, still going to be quite a bit of office space in there. And at a time when, you know, the biggest building in town or complex of buildings, the Renson is hurting for tenants. I don't see, I mean, he's going to, he may have to really be fluid on, on some of these revisions. So. We'll well, the, the Renaissance center has the potential to be uh, another auto world. like in Flint. <laughs> where it's just, just, just going to be abandoned. I think it's it should auto be world, it oh, should yeah. be a movie set uh, on, uh, you know, for post-apocalyptic yeah. uh, horror films. Go ahead. I, I just want to say real quickly, I, I went to Auto World once. Uh, it was the most horrific, it was the po most poorly put together <laughs> thing I'd ever seen. It was like, so it was so sad because it was part of Flint's comeback and it was so poorly designed and yeah. ex executed. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, moving on. Politico had a pretty good piece this week about uh, Detroit's failure, speaking of city council, to um, in their in their effort to carve out a piece of the cannabis business for black Detroiters or for Detroiters, I should say, um, they have essentially fumbled the entire recreational uh, marijuana issue. And now you have uh, entrepreneurs, Detroit native entrepreneurs 
who are going out of business because of all the hoops that they had to jump through to get a recreational uh, or a license to sell recreational marijuana. Um, what does this say about what does this say about uh, the city and its its efforts to uh, take care of its own residents? Not much, I'd say. Well, they've been <laughs> go, go ahead. ahead. No, so, go ahead, Adolf. Oh, I'm sorry, Bryce. Go ahead. No, nah, go ahead. If you want to be an optimist, right? Uh, yeah. It says that city council is in a position where they are trying to do right by people. And that makes things complicated because doing the right thing often is complicated. If you're a skeptic, um, and many of us are as journalists uh, and, and media folks, uh, you would say that they just completely miscalculated how best to help Detroiters. Um, there were a lot of options on the table when recreational passed, uh, what, four years ago in 2018, that a lot of other cities went with those models of just allowing as many licenses as possible, um, changing zoning requirements to make it easier for more businesses to open in the city, um, making it so more people had just the opportunity to get into the business, which is already a lot of hoops and legal uh, hoopla to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when I've talked to people on city council, they reaffirm their commitment to, you know, letting legacy Detroiters or longtime Detroiters get the upper hand. And as that political piece pointed out very plainly, it failed. Yeah, very true. We, Adolf? we, we have heard this before. We, we heard it with casinos. Uh, it, it, it didn't work out for Detroiters. Now we're hearing it for, uh, well, we want Detroiters to have it. We got 75 to 100 medical facilities already inside the city. It, why wouldn't they just say, okay, you went through the hoops to get this licenses, to get the uh, property zoned. You, you, you can just convert to a, a recreational. And then you talk about uh, doing the right thing with, with those folks. People going out of business. We're going to have empty buildings all around the city. Uh, they've been doing this for years. When we when they talked about uh, topless bars, they was special interest groups come here, ministers who don't live in Detroit, and, and they protest because they don't want marijuana. They didn't want uh, topless bars. They didn't want casinos. And, and, and the city council always been having the hate be behind the eight ball. Detroit was in the forefront of this marijuana thing. Now they now they behind the eight ball and what are they gonna do? James Tate personally don't want uh recreational marijuana. He 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 he's cushioned an idea that he knows is gonna be tied up in court a long time. These lawsuits are coming every day. So they gotta do something. Uh, make it easier. They need to revisit. Take the cap off in this. Take the well, cap off and let let as many. If that, there's not going to be one on every corner. It's it, it just not because well, people yeah, don't have the forces, Market forces would take care of that. You know, yeah. and, uh, the the problem, and you know, and here we have this metro area that has you know a central city and and quite a lot of you know independent uh, suburbs right you know right across the street from it. They're all. They, you know, River Rouge went all in on this. Hazel Park went all in on this. It, you know, they they said, come on in. And I don't notice that River Rouge or Hazel Park is suffering because, you know, there's a lot of weed uh, places down there. Ham Tramic. Ham Tramic is another one. Exactly. So, and, you know, I mean, now the, the business is so weird now. I mean, there's this glut of supply. Um, you know, the prices should be dropping. I don't, I don't use weed, so I can't tell you. But no, cocaine um, girl. It, <laughs> <laughs> oh, if, I was gonna, if I was gonna get involved in any sort of illicit or um, you know, drug abusive drug, I think it would be something like Adderall, so I could at least chip off a few pounds. But anyway, um, all right. So I think we all agree that they uh, they fumbled that one. Um, well, I, I haven't said anything about it, so oh, so say something. No, I'm I'm not saying they fumbled it or not, but but one of the things. That I think so. Let me give you a perspective of somebody in the neighborhood. River Rouge and Hazel Park may be doing great with all that shit, but have you asked the people who live around the corner from it? Because seeing a bunch of zombies walk around your neighborhood is no picnic. And for a little while, the only stores that were opening on Mac Avenue on the east side here were weed shops. 
and you just saw young people walking around like zombies, and I'm pretty sure they didn't all have glaucoma. So <laughs> this does need to be regulated. But one of the problems government has is government is not particularly good at figuring shit out. And government is not very good at picking winners and losers. And this is all about trying to make sure that people in Detroit have a stake in this bonanza. Now, Adolph mentioned casinos. We saw some folks made partners in these casino deals who got made rich, but I didn't see them put a lot of that back into the neighborhood. So that was another case of checking boxes and picking winners and losers didn't have the intended effect. The other thing is when city council tries to do shit like this, like when they tried to ban strip clubs and you can't do that, in the end, there are a lot of lawsuits and the city of Detroit, instead of strip clubs, wrote a million dollar check to strip clubs. I think what these lawsuits that Adolf's talking about, if it plays out like it did with the strip clubs, in the end, it's going to be wild, wild west. We're just going to put it off for several years. And the city of Detroit is going to be writing some checks to some folks who want to open some weed shops who said, you restricted my trade unconstitutionally for a number of years. You damaged me. Here's how much that's worth. Now write me a damn check. That's where I think this may be headed. And if that's the case, man, we don't need to be writing any more big checks. Well, we need to do the right thing. We got we got all these liquor stores. And listen, we got we got a a, a a a liquor store on every corner. We got a church on every corner. Uh, it, it just you know what the city council don't do right. We got we got property on Seven Mile and Woodward. We got a church that I took twenty years to to build, and and they still haven't finished it. It's not open, and <laughs> you know what? Only in Detroit where we can have things like that because the city council is chicken shit. That's all I'm saying, and I lay it on the line. The chicken so, shit. There's definitely something to that, and and I think the pastor you're talking about hates weed and lives in the suburbs. But uh, don't want to finish that church either. But but the thing is, city council, I think if I'm going to I'm going to take Bryce's cue and try and be an optimist on this rather than try and be a pessimist on this. They're trying to avoid a situation that we all hear about all the time. Yeah, we got a grocery store all over the place. We got bodegas throughout the city, but none of those people who own them live in the city of Detroit. We hear that all the time. That is a hugely divisive issue. It's about our wealth going out to someplace else. City council, I think if we take them at their word, is trying to avoid that with these weed shops. The problem is it's really hard to find a solution. Give to 60 million to the small black businesses. Give 60 million. Give that 60 million to these these, these entrepreneurs are, are trying to open. Give 100 million to the, those neighborhood activists that's trying to bring in more jobs and stuff. We gave $400 million to the Illiches, the most greediest family mm -hmm. in the state of Michigan. Uh, we took it from the schools. Yeah. Then now, if we, go, if we really want to do that, take that money and, and give it uh, to those folks. Here we got an area, it, it used to be called Harmony Park. It's supposed to be, well, uh, Black Bottom Paradise Valley. Nobody black. They ran all the black entrepreneurs out of those uh, restaurants and bars. It sits empty because they want to give them to their favorite folks, the Gary Targos and all these folks that come in and buy up all the buildings. That's, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to, if you want to get uh, black folks involved in some of this, take the $60 million and give it to those groups that can open up uh, a business now, instead of giving it to somebody that got more money than uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's that's okay. the solution. If you want to level a playing field, you have to have a venture capital fund that's going to support local entrepreneurs because that's why our small business folks can't get these businesses open because the banks see them as a high risk. They do not want to make traditional loans to them. So we need to fill that gap in with some bridge financing and some investor capital money where we can say, if you, first time guy, want to compete with a dude who owns, if you want to compete with Ron Boji, who owns everything, you're going to need some dough and we can help you with the dough. Otherwise, th these guys who live out on Orchard Lake Road in the gated communities, they're going to own all these weed shops because they own all the grocery stores. Yeah. And we're going to be fighting about that too. Okay. And, the and the gas station. 
And the, that's what I'm saying. That, I that, mean, there's a there's a few programs like that, but they're they're too small and too few and too small. I mean, like the what is it, Hatch Detroit or whatever that thing is. Well, give money to some people that want to uh, 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 African Americans that want to be involved in the cannabis business. Uh, uh, set 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 some money aside and say, okay, uh, we're gonna help you get started. And okay. don't punish the people that put in millions of dollars already that's sitting there. I, you know what? Whether you like them or not, there, there's, there are black folks that own some medical marijuana shops that are about to close up. Some of them have already closed up. They need to make a decision. That's all I'm saying. Okay. You know well, what? Revisit, is- revisit the ordinance. Revisit okay. the ordinance and make it better for everybody involved instead of these lawsuits that's going to go on and on. And the city didn't give a million dollars to Hustler. They gave $10 million. They lost big time because they didn't want a Hustler to open up downtown. So, okay. yes, they're going to lose all these lawsuits. Before, I understand that suddenly was paid for in single dollar bills. Okay. <laughs> hey, before we before we get to the uh, traditional ending of the show, I do want to take a minute here to take a quick poll of the panel. Anybody here ever been on a pedal pub in downtown Detroit? I like, have. You have. What was the experience yeah. like, Bryce? I mean, I did it for a friend's twenty first birthday years ago. It was fun, but I also. I don't know. I'd rather just be at a bar. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. Like it's a, it's a fun thing to do kind of like as a first time, like you're kind of new to drinking you're like, Oh, this is cool. But it, yeah. Like now that I'm older, it's just like, why would I not just go to one bar? And if I want to go to another bar, I can walk to that other bar. <laughs> well, of course, you know, why I'm asking we've had, we had an accident uh, this week, which uh, this story got insane traffic for what it was, which was a, not serious injury accident of a woman falling off of a pedal pub and then being run over by it. But um, I am waiting as my, my, I'm a sailor. My husband has a boat and I am waiting for the, one of the Tiki uh, boats to have some kind of catastrophic uh, malfunction. I'm thinking like catch fire or there could be a mutiny. That's my favorite is the mutiny. Was she drunk? We don't know. We don't know. folks uh, riding those things. We don't know, but the whole point of being on a pedal pub is to drink while being, you know, driven or pulling <laughs> around the city. So I think we can assume that she had at least something. Uh, she didn't have a point zero zero uh, blood alcohol content. I, I, anyway. have poli- I have a policy with the pedal pubs. I do not wave back. That, oh. be, I would stand <laughs> at the queue line. You know, sitting at the platform, and they're like, "Ah!" Yeah, just, <laughs> they always go. like, "Woo!" I'm like, "No, I'm not acknowledging you." <laughs> All right. Well, I wish to see a survey of how many people have ridden on a pedal pub and how many have ridden on the queue line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a whole that's a whole can of worms right there. The queue line. I mean, they were giving away free rides for most of the time it's been open. Just yeah. No one rides it. Yeah. yeah, they're not. No. Uh, it's they were closed small. for two years during the pandemic. They were closed for two so years, right? Yeah. All right, uh, Lengel. Are um, we ready? Are you prepared for the uh, closing act. You're schmuck. Yeah, brother struck. Yeah, brother struck. All right. This, uh, yeah, never gets old, huh? Uh, so we're, we're at the end of the show. We're, we traditionally, um, in a nod to our um, grew up speaking Yiddish at home, uh, co-founder Alan Lingo, we named the Schmuck of the Week. Um, it is the, officially, I believe, Craig Folly, the founder of the show, uh, called it the Donald J. Trump Schmuck of the Week Award. And <laughs> the only rule was you can't name Trump because the award is named for him. He is the schmuck. He is the schmuck. He's the primal schmuck. So who wants to go first? Anyone? I'll I'll go. For me, it's Clarence. Okay, Bryce. Okay. All right. Yeah. (laughs) Clarence. Like, like if I ever have the displeasure of meeting you, Clarence, I'm going to tell you what I think about you in much less kind words than I'm saying. And that's saying something. So, all right, right then. I like that one. (laughs) Okay, Clarence. Um, Anyone else? ML? Sure. Uh, I, I guess my schmuck of the week is any sailor who criticizes people on a pedal pub for drinking while they're out having a good time. 
because we know that never happens with sailors. No, never, ever, ever. Never. <laughs> Our uh, mutual friend, Sandy Svoboda, uh, was talking about her house once, and she said something like, uh, you know, I have a lot of sailors who sleep over sometimes as house guests, and, and the bathroom on the second floor is right next to my bedroom, and I can hear them throwing up at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so uh, I totally get it. Um, Adolf. Uh, the six idiots that sit on the Supreme Court. Okay. That I uh, that decision speaks for itself. Yeah, I think it does. Um, and there were two bad ones this week, so you know you can yeah. say that about the gun, uh, the over overturning the gun uh, law in New York, and um, also uh, the one that we just heard about early this morning. Um, Langle. I got two. Uh, Jeffrey Clark. I thought, oh my God, is there a bigger schmuck? Uh, and and John I also, Eastman, maybe. Uh, yeah, John <laughs> Eastman, and and then also I watched Fox News uh, for a little bit, uh, and and it was suddenly like, here's all the shit that's going on. They've raided Jeffrey Clark's home. The January sixth committee was so the testimony was so compelling and damaging, and Fox News is suddenly like, flash news alert. Nancy Pelosi's husband has been charged with a DUI. And I thought that was so funny. Breaking. Yeah. <laughs> so they're schmucks at Fox. Okay. All right. Well, because there is always such a surfeit of schmucks in an average week around here, I always try to have a backup. And I was originally going to pick Clarence Thomas too, Bryce. Um, but I am going to go to my second one, which is the five Michigan... Uh, state representatives who have co-sponsored um, or co-sponsoring and introducing a almost certainly doomed bill in the House uh, to impose 10-year penalties on anyone who um, um, abets, aids and abets an abortion. And I believe there's something like 20 years for anyone who provides abortion-inducing medication, which is very strange. But it's it's the usual rogues gallery. It's Matt Maddock, Gary Eisen, Dare Rendon up in up north, and a couple other. Oh, Steve Kara, and there's one more that I can't remember. But um, these are the people who, and of course, in what is probably the second most infuriating uh, female-related news of the week, this bill would hold women who seek out abortions harmless. It would only punish the people who provide them which is so condescending. It's like, if I hire a hitman to kill somebody, am I, if, if they truly believe that abortion is murder, then that's essentially what a woman is doing when she seeks out an abortion. And the idea that somehow they have to make this more palatable to their idiot constituents by holding women harmless just blows my mind. But anyway, so that just, I think we just assume the women would be dead because they're going to get illegal abortions. So yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about back alley abortions and, you know, medication, uh, abortion medication kind of took a lot of those um, really changed the calculus on that because when you can take two pills in the privacy of your home, um, it's, it's going to be very different, but anyway, all right, that is a wrap then on yet another Friday, the week that was, um, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up with me today. Um, ML Elric, Bryce Huffman, Adolf Mongo. And as always, we give the last word. Drive home safely. Okay. <laughs> Thanks everybody. See you next week.